As you can see, my title is uh, The Evaluation of Beef Cattle Selection Methods for Productivity in Grass-Fed Production Systems. And if I'd known how many times I was going to have to say that over the last two years, I probably would, would have picked a much shorter title. Um, first of all, I'd just really like to thank uh, my sponsors, the Worshipful Company of Butchers. Um, I think Bob is somewhere in here. Where are you, Bob? There you are. Um, always been in contact, always supporting, finding people across the world that I could go and see and visit. And, and um, you know, it's a real privilege and very grateful for the opportunity you've given me, and along with Nuffield as well. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, I also want to thank my parents, uh, my children, my partner Lizzie, for their patience throughout this whole process. Um, and also for my staff for looking after everything while I was away and ev you know, everything that goes on with this process. So I had a wonderful opportunity to travel um, all across the world. Uh, particularly enjoyed going to Africa, seeing in Uganda community agriculture product, uh, projects. And, and interestingly seeing cattle being promoted and taken on in system, high, high production cattle in systems in a harsh environment that were just falling apart in that environment. But for me, in terms of the topic title, South America was really the key. Um, and it gave me an insight into people managing numbers of cattle where the ability to select and just have really harsh selection on huge numbers of cattle across huge areas you know, was just the, really made the difference. And that's something that, you know, I hope to be able to apply back over here. So if we're talking about cattle selection, um, if we just look at that slide, the picture of the bull that we've, we've got up there. This is the sort of the, the pinnacle of progress that we've got to in production, perhaps in, in beef, or is it? Um, this is an animal that has you know, a lot of lean muscle mass. It's got very high growth rate. The daily live weight gains will be off the charts. Um, but what are the welfare implications of an animal like this? You can see from its conformation and how it's standing that it, it struggles actually to move. And somebody told me a story about the champion blue bull at the Royal Welsh Show that actually couldn't walk around the parade ring. They had to put it in a trailer. Uh, and you just sort of wonder where we're going with this sort of thing. Um, what are the welfare impl implications for that? Um, and at a time where it's never been more important to tell positive stories about our industry, how does that line up? What are the optics on that sort of thing? Um, how does this sort of production system or that selection impact fertility as well? And what's the impact on animal welfare from that? Carving ease issues uh, lead to fertility problems, lead to longer bulling periods, longer calving periods. The cohort of calves then are in uh, different ages. So if you're aiming to carve at two, Perhaps some of the heifers then that are coming through the following year, they might have three or four months between them. It's going to have a very big impact on your fertility rates, on how many you're going to be getting in calf. Um, and then finally, just in terms of energy requirements for an animal like this, we, our environment is a limited environment, and we have to operate within that environment. But if we create animals that energy requirement is above what the environment pr can produce, and that leads us to have to provide that extra environment in a bag, essentially through our back pocket. Um, so all of this selection, all the science has led us here. And I just wonder if there isn't perhaps a better way. Because it's really not working for us. If you look at the UK CTS data on calving intervals, the average is 426 days. And this has actually got worse year on year for the last few years. We should be aiming at a 365-day <coughs> calving interval. And if that's the average, then more or less half of, of the producers in this, in this survey are worse than this. Uh, and then age at first calving, if we're aiming to carve at two, the average is 34 months, almost three years old, which means, again, that probably uh, almost half are, are worse than that. And despite all the selection that we've had, and the science that we've used in estimated breeding values and growth rates, in the US, the weaning weight, the average weaning weight, hasn't increased in the last 30 years. And that's largely because the cows operate in a different system to the finished animals. And so the cows are limited by their environment, and the calves can grow to what the environment can produce. So if we have animals with a higher energy requirement of that, we're not going to see those benefits of that genetic performance. So we now have bigger cows that wean fewer, slightly bigger calves, 
um, but with much higher energy costs for us in terms of maintenance of the cows and maintenance of those systems. So why is that? Um, and I think one of the things is there are often unintended consequences to the selection methods that we use. If we just look at selection for growth on its own, one of the things I've learned through this process is that selecting for growth rate is not just about selecting for more kilos. What you're actually doing is selecting for the dominance of growth hormone over reproductive hormones. One of the problems with that is that the reproductive hormones are really rather important for reproduction. And fertility is a key thing that we need to have profitability in our suckler herds. So as an unintended consequence, we have to manage that and make sure we're not pushing things too far. In terms of eye muscle area, it seems to make sense that we'd select for an animal with the most expensive part of the carcass. Well, we want more of that, don't we? But that, the trouble is that that's correlated with calving difficulty. So you're adding a cost in at another part of the business and potentially a welfare problem too. If we're selecting on weaning weight and we're selecting on feed efficiency, are we selecting on more milk for the cow? And is that potentially leading to a higher maintenance cost that we're putting into our cow, breeding into our replacement cows if we select for that? And again, if it's feed efficiency, are we selecting for growth rate? Are we selecting for a change in the hormone balance of the animal? Do we really know what we're selecting for if we're just weighing? We have to look at the whole picture. A great example of this is when they introduced the first calving ease estimated breeding value, which was a simple thing, was essentially selecting if something was born easily. And then there was a, a metric and an algorithm created for that. But what happened was, because we were selecting for growth at the same time, we ended up with growthy heifers and steers that were growing up, but they kept narrow hips so that they were born easily. When those heifers came to maturity, they still had narrower hips. So they had calving difficulty. So our selection for calving ease led to calving difficulty because we're selecting in two different directions at once and that leads to unintended consequences. It's very easy to get things wrong, with, especially when you're pairing antagonistic traits. If you look at gestation length, again, pairing growth rate with trying to have a shorter gestation, which is something dairy farmers like to have. They get some more days in milk from the cows. But that led to uh, premature calves, low calf vigor, and the calf health problems that come through that uh, when you don't get a good start in life. There's an interesting um, focus at the moment, especially on eating quality and looking at marbling in meat. But it, we have to ask ourselves, why do we have a problem with marbling in our meat at the moment? And it's because we've had years and years of selection for lean muscle mass. So we're effectively making our product to the consumer worse for a little bit more output. And again, there are problems with selecting for marbling whilst also selecting for lean muscle mass. Because a fertile bull that will have higher testosterone levels, those higher testosterone levels will lead to a leaner muscle mass in the animal. So selecting for both things, you're going to change that hormone balance and potentially you're selecting for less fertile bulls. And again, rather important characteristic for a bull that works 60 days a year. So nothing is free, everything's a trade-off and the environment is limited and we're constrained by it. We have to work within it. And every time we add energy costs in or unintended consequences, the costs of those come from our bank, bank account, our back pocket. Rather than look at growth rate, what happens if we look at another metric, if we look at fertility, where if you look at the difference, some of those you know, very sort of strong carcass animals, you'll see much lower rates of weaning compared to, say, a grass-fed native system. Uh, so you can see 75% versus 95% weaning. That's 20 ca calves on 100 cows. That's six tonnes of live weight extra it's very difficult to get that back just through extra growth rate individually. And that's another 80 kilos on those six-month-old calves in order to get that. Um, and if you add that, those 20 calves up, and then you, perhaps you sell them as stores at 18 months, that's an extra 25,000 to the business on that 100-cow system. So just to point out that fertility in all the, everything I've looked at has always seemed to be the number one profit predictor in every place I visited. Uh, Nesta Scioli has uh, a fantastic visit in the Buenos Aires uh, province of Argentina. 
Um, 2,000 pedigree Angus cows, so he's got huge ability to, to apply selection pressure over that sort of scale. Um, we didn't speak the same language, but you can just see in the picture he's holding up a copy of Jan Bonsma's book on cattle selection, um, something that I've used for the last five years as well. So we didn't speak the same language, but we did both speak Jan Bonsma, so that helped. And he had, uh, he had a thing where he had a maximum hip height of 127 centimetres, very specific. Um, but he found that to go above that level while selecting for weight gain, it was the increase in frame size that laid, led to an increase in maintenance costs. Uh, he used the visual assessment of cattle uh, using the Bonsma system and real data, not algorithms through estimated breeding values. So real weights, all the calving history data, all the behavioural stuff from all of the cows, that was his selection method. Another um, rancher in uh, the western part of that province in Argentina, Alberto Areco. 10,000 cows on 25,000 acres. Um, he would fertility test 1,000 bull calves, 10-month-old bull calves a year. He'd select the best 100 and put them on 1,000 heifers. 80% of those calves would be by 20% of the bulls. And he'd DNA test to find out. And those resulting bulls that had worked so well, that is where he then took his, his bull team for his herd. And he's been using this kind of selection for 30 years. Over in Argentina and South America in particular, they cannot afford, you know, if you've got 10,000 cows, you can't lose 50 pound a cow because that's half a million quid. So they have to get it right and they are miles ahead. They're 30, 40 years ahead of us over here on fertility section, uh, selection. Probably the, the most enjoyable visit I had was to Uruguay, um, an incredible family, the Mailhaus family. Um, the, uh, the sort of patriarch of the family, Juan Maria, sort of this Charlton Heston sort of character in his 80s riding off on his, on his horse across his 25,000 acres. 5,000 pedigree cows, really tough selection. So they carve everything at two, 60-day breeding period, and they only keep first and second cycle breeders, so they're always selecting on that fertility. Um, they cull any empties, and they don't carry any of that, and they're using old genetics, so traditional Hereford genetics in the Hereford herd, native Angus genetics going back to animals that have a low maintenance requirement, that thrifty can survive in their environment, and they'd had a really tough year with a long drought that just was going on and on. But for them, the environment decides the level of production. They do not decide, the environment does. They don't try and beat that, they try and fit within it, environmental fit. So in terms of what we want from a cow, there's all this complexity of estimated breeding values using the algorithms, all the data we, we collect. But after this Nuffield journey, what's really come out to me is that we, we can really keep it simple. All we really need is a marketable calf every year, on time, problem free. And if we can do that for our suckler cow production systems, we can have cows that work for the welfare of the animals, that work for the environment and also for the finances of the family farm. Thank you very much.